Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadha, Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, what do you remember from yesterday? Anything? Yes? Importance is coming to mode of goodness. Okay. Yeah, what are you going to do to come to the mode of goodness? You got any plans to help you come more to the mode of goodness? Class week study. Hmm? Class week study and morning program. Oh, okay. Yeah. You already have that. You're already doing that class week study and morning program. What are you going to do to come more to the mode of goodness? Come more to the mode of goodness, right? You're already coming to morning program. You could come to the morning program in the mode of ignorance. Be more clean. Huh? Try to be, be more clean, take two, three times a while. Yeah, I hope you do that. Yeah, you should bathe a couple. Brahmacharis, Sanyas is supposed to bathe three times a day. Lord Chaitanya, when he stayed at Puri, he was bathing three times a day in the sea. <laughs> hmm. uh, bathe in the sea, that's salt water. After you bathe in the salt water, you need to take bath to get the salt off. <laughs> because the salt. But Lord Chaitanya, reg at three times a day, we go to bathe in the sea. Sannyasi is supposed to bathe three times a day. Uh, householders bathe twice a day. Brahmacharis can bathe once a day. But you can bathe also in the holy name. Even if you have no water, <laughs> can be in the holy name. Yes? Tolerating the urges of the tongue to speak. Yeah, we have to tolerate. <laughs> but what are we going to do to curb them? Uh, speak more of Krishna glories. All right. We're going to do more preaching, more speaking, more maybe more reading. No chanting. These things can help us, yes? You also heard, Maharaj that the uh, root of uh, sin is ignorance. Ah, yes. The root of sin, ignorance. And from ignorance comes? Because of ignorance? Passion. From ignorance, because of ignorance we get desires, material desires. And with material desires leads to? Sinful activities. Sinful activity and sinful activities result in suffering. Suffering, right? So, <laughs> so we have to try to over, over, remove the ignorance from the heart. Okay. So we'll go on. Uh, as to the urges of the tongue, we are. We, are, we all experience that the tongue wants to, to eat palatable dishes. Generally, we should not allow the tongue to eat according to its choice, but should control the tongue by supplying prasad. The devotee's attitude is that he will eat only when Krishna gives him prasad. That is the way to control the urge of the tongue. One should take prasad at scheduled times and should not eat in restaurants or sweetmeat shops simply to satisfy the whims of the tongue or belly. If we stick to the principle of taking only prasad, the urges of the belly and tongue can be controlled. So it's very relevant here in India because you do have things like sweet meat shops. <laughs> in the Western world it's not so common, but certainly here in India every street corner there's a sweet meat shop. So I remember when the devote, when Gorpurnima festival was becoming popular and devotees were coming more and the, the devotees were also thinking about beginning Govinda restaurants in the West, you know, devotees coming from America and so on. 
they were thinking we should open a Govinda restaurant. So their planning was, we will go to India, <coughs> and when we go to India, we'll go to the restaurants and we'll check out the menus, you know, try the different dishes and see what kind of things they are preparing, what things they are offering. <laughs> so many devotees came to India with that kind of mentality, thinking, you know, we're going to go around the restaurants and check them out. And, and so Prabhupada came, and Prabhupada, the very first day, practically, he said to all the devotees, don't eat in the restaurants. <laughs> yeah. He said, don't eat in the restaurants. He said, you are not, now you are devotees of Krishna, you put on the kunti mala and the tilak, and many of you have shaved heads and sikash. He said, if you go and eat in the restaurants, it will look very bad. Because devotees, we're supposed to show sense control, and we shouldn't eat in these kind of places. And Giri Rajswami tells how in the 1970s, early 1970s, devotees were sometimes going to one Indian man. He'd become a life member and a supporter and he had a restaurant and the devotees would regularly go there. You know? <laughs> and the man was very nice to them and so on. But Prabhupada chastised them and said, this is not good. He said, you cannot do this. And there was also the time Prabhupada had said, he said, you know, everything in Vrindavan is prasadam. So there were some new, new devotees there and they were riding in the rickshaw and they'd go past the sweet shops and you know how in Vrindavan they have these big baskets of sweets sitting there and there. And so they came past in the rickshaw, they took some of the sweets, you know. <laughs> and so the man went, ah, oh, you know, taking our... And they came to Prabhupada to complain. And they said, your devotees are taking our, our sweets. They're not paying for them, they're just coming and taking them from us. And Prabhupada said, what? Who is this? And so they found out some devotee call, called them and said, why are you just taking the sweets? They said, Prabhupada, you said everything is prasadam. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we could just take it. Prabhupada told them, no, no, you have to, you cannot do like that. And so, <laughs> sometimes devotees, you know, <laughs> especially coming from the West, you know, they, we don't know so well the etiquette, we don't know how to behave. So Prabhupada certainly didn't like us to go to eat in the restaurants and the sweet meat shops and things. And I have to be careful. And he suggests just take prasadam at regulated times. If you have a regulated time, then the tongue becomes controlled. Right? How to conquer lust? Remember we were speaking from Bhagavad but uh, Lord Krishna was Arjuna had asked, what, how, why do we perform sinful activities, even unwilling, as if engaged by force? And Lord Krishna explained about lust. It is the all-devouring sinful enemy and so on. And where it's found, it's seated in the senses, in the mind, in the intelligence. And then how to overcome it? How to overcome it? By regulating the senses. So, when our senses are regulated, then you can, it's much easier to conquer over the tongue. If we have that kind of control, that this isn't the time to eat, now we take prasadam. And the rest of the time we don't take prasadam. When I joined the movement, like, like you know, in 1971 I joined the movement, so in those days we were told, we don't eat grains after four o'clock. That was the standard. Prabhupada said, better not to eat grains after four o'clock. We would just take some, you could take a little, if you're a little sabji or, of course, if you're not taking lunch, then it's different. Like your devotees here, you're not taking lunch. You take breakfast and then you take your lunch about four o'clock. Okay, so you take your lunch at four o'clock. 
and so you finish. So it's a, a little later you, you you can, but after you don't want to be eating grains too late at night because it's heavy in the stomach and difficult to digest. And if you eat heavy food at night, then it's difficult to wake up in the morning. So it's important to observe some kind of regulation there. And also, it's, it's, in the Ayurvedas, they say, take water before the meal. Water before the meal is like nectar, water during the meal is like medicine, and water after the meal is like poison. And because water after, it will put out the fire of digestion. And so, these are different points for health. The Buddhists, if, uh, you know, I preach in some Buddhist countries, so the Buddhists, they have the training, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. They have the, they have the training in the Buddhist tradition that they only eat two meals a day. They don't eat after 12 o'clock. They won't eat, at, they eat breakfast and then they'll eat before 12. They won't eat after that. That's the Buddhist monk. That's how, how the Buddhist monks are supposed to live. That's, of course, there's two schools of Buddhism. There's the Theravada and the Mahayana. Uh, the Theravada is the old tradition, like the Thai Buddhists and the Sri Lankan and the Burma. They're Theravada. So they're the ones who eat meat and so on. But they're very strict. After, they won't eat in the afternoon. So sometimes they ask, how many meals do you eat a day? <laughs> They'll ask you. Because usually ordinary people will eat three meals a day. But the monks only eat two meals a day. And we also only eat two meals a day. You can see. And we don't eat heavy food at night. So that's a good regulation to have. Especially you want to keep your brahmachari, brahmacharya, it, it's a good help. There was one man came to treat Jaipataka Swami Maharaj. He was a very famous Chinese doctor, Chinese traditional medicine. And he came to treat Jaipataka Swami Maharaj. And he said, he said, I can cure any disease if you won't eat after two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> he said like that. Uh, so that was what he was saying. And some of the devotees, they started not to eat after two o'clock and they found a big improvement in their health. So at the point, uh, you don't want to eat heavy too late at night. It's not recommended. And Prabhupada, Prabhupada would take a very light food at night. Sometimes he would take some puff rice, muri, you know. Sometimes, because Bengali, they like that muri, Prabhupada liked it. And sometimes, sometimes he would take a halava, because he would say, he said, he said the halava will stop him from passing urine. If he, uh, because if he has to pass urine, then it ruins his sleep, and he would wake up in the night to pass urine, it ruins his sleep. So Prabhupada would take, a hal take some halava and that would absorb the water in his body and he could get more rest. Prabhupada actually didn't rest very much. He would just take a few hours and usually he'd wake up about midnight to do translation. So he, he, would, some, he would do these different things. So Controlling the tongue, very important for the brahmacharis and for devotees practicing spiritual life. As we had, remember the first thing in all spiritual matters, to control the mind and senses. And of all the senses, what is the most difficult sense to control? The tongue. The tongue. Yeah, the mind of course is even more difficult than the tongue, but we're talking about senses. The mind is a little above this higher, let's say, we could say the king of the senses. 
So certainly controlling the tongue, very important. So regulation means just take Krishna prasada. If it's not prasada, then we don't take it. And when you go to people's houses, then be careful, you know, evening programs, you're going, maybe they come, invite you to come to their home and you go for kirtan, to the, and then they expect you to eat. Of course, you, you have to accept something. If you don't eat, they're not happy. Yeah. Even sometimes, in Prabhupada's time, sometimes they would go to some man's home and they may cook something and the man may serve a sabji with onions in it. And the devotee will say, Prabhupada, there's onions in this. And Prabhupada, there's no onions in it. But the devotee says, Prabhupada, there's onions in it. Really, it's onion. Prabhupada, there's no onion in it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but because he was a very important man, so Prabhupada didn't want to offend the man by, you know, complaining that you've cooked with onions. So Prabhupada let the devotees eat the onions, but he didn't eat it. <laughs> he let the devotees eat it. <laughs> Interesting. So everything according to time and circumstances, you know. Sometimes you have to do these things, but generally we prefer to avoid it. Just like there was a courtesy incident. The devotees in the Gaudiya Mat, in the times of Bhakti Siddhanta, Sarasati Prabhupada, the devotees were observing a courtesy and they were doing fasting. They were not eating. They decided we won't eat, we'll just chant and have kirtan, we won't, we won't cook, we won't eat anything. But then an invitation came for some preaching program. That same day they wanted devotees to come for a program. But the devotees said, no, no, we're all fasting today. We can't go for any program today. And Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada said, why not? And they said, Prabhupada, we're all fasting. So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati said, then cook and go for the program. He didn't care very much about fasting. Preaching was more important than fasting. So, of course, cook a codice prasadam, you know, a codice prasadam. Just like Prabhupada had devotees observe a codice in the beginning, and Prabhupada would cook an a codice feast. He would cook a feast for the devotees on a codice because he wanted to encourage them and keep them inspired in Krishna consciousness. And too much austerity, too much dry austerity is not good. Some people, they're very you know, attached to, you know, near jow, full fasting, you know, and like that, and st even staying awake all night. Lord Chaitanya used to do that. Lord Chaitanya wouldn't eat, he wouldn't drink, he wouldn't sleep stay awake all night on ekadasi. So that's a full ekadasi vrat, but you know it's not so possible for many people to do that. How many people can do that? And even Bhaktivinoda Thakur chastised Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati. He said, because Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was doing nirjal, fasting on ekadasi, but Bhaktivinoda Thakur told him, he said, this is not necessary in the Kali Yuga. You don't need to do all that. So from that time on, then Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he would begin to take fruit, and he would eat fruit, a plate of fruit in the afternoon on a Kalasi. So we have to understand how to apply Krishna consciousness, how to be Krishna conscious, how to observe the principles, we're not so much attached to great austerities. That is not really required. We want to cultivate devotion rather than just practice dry austerities, fasting. And sometimes you fast and you're so weak 
You just can't do anything. You just sleep all day, you know. You don't do anything hardly. So what's the good of that? But if you take some ikarasi prasadam and do service, that's much better. All right? Any questions about this? You understand this? We have to learn how to apply these principles and not be fanatic. Yes, Prabhu? Maharaj, if like, we are practicing very strictly, then one shouldn't take anything. So, as you uh, said in the case of like, Prabhupada, Prabhupada went to the life member's house and uh, then there was money. So, it's like, we can show very strictness in this, in that and that we cannot take uh, he can, he could have tell, told that, no, we cannot take this onion. But Prabhupada told the devotees to take. Prabhupada told the devotees, Prabhupada didn't want to offend the man. So how to apply in our life? We, might, uh, we can also have in the same similar situation. So. Well, you should avoid that situation. You tell the person before you come there. I don't eat onion and garlic, you know. If somebody's going, to, if they're going to offer you cooked food, you have to tell them that I have a very strict diet. I don't eat, the, and, and they'll respect that. <coughs> People will respect that, that you have that strictness. You're observing certain principles. It's not really an offense. But you just tell them in a nice way, you know, that uh, I, I'm sorry, but I don't take these, kind, I don't eat these foods. And then you say, oh, onion is vegetarian. Oh, yes, it is vegetarian, but it's also rajasic. It's, 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 it, it increases, it greatly stimulates the passion in the body. Even pilots in, air, in certain airlines, they won't let the pilots take garlic before flying because it influences their judgment. So th these things like garlic and onion, they're aphrodisiacs. Aphrodisiacs means it stimulates the lust and the passion in the body. We're already lusty and passionate. And you're going to eat things that will make you more lusty and passionate? It's not very good. And so, we have to be careful. Right? You have to know how to apply these things. Uh, Maharaj, once I heard <coughs> during Prabhupada time only, that uh, one devotee was sick, so Prabhupada allowed him to take some onion garlic as a medicine. So, can it be taken for us also, or how? Yeah, I've heard like that. I've heard like that. There was one devotee, they, they were having intestinal worms, and the cure for it was to take garlic tablets. And so, you know, you have a, you have a disease, you have a health problem. If that's going to help you cure it, yeah, then you could take it. Yeah. Krishna consciousness is practical. Of course, you don't go on taking it. You just take it enough to cure the disease, right? When you get so many, you get these potato chips, potato crisps, they have onion flavored and things like that, you know? So we don't take these kind of things. Be careful what you eat. Very all of, all of these kind of uh, snacks, right? Packets of potato crisps and so on. They're not even real, f it's not real food, you know, it's just some chemicals. They say potato chips, it's not, it's not even potatoes, it's made, <laughs> it's made from some chemicals. They make, they, they use it, they use chemicals to manufacture the things. Okay, we'll go ahead. In a similar manner, the urges of the genitals, the sex impulse, can be controlled when not used unnecessarily. The genitals 
should be used to beget a Krishna conscious child. Otherwise, they should not be used. This, the Krishna conscious movement encourages marriage not for the satisfaction of the genitals, but for the begetting of Krishna conscious children. As soon as the children are a little grown up, they are sent to our Gurukula school in Dallas, Texas, where they are trained to become fully Krishna conscious devotees. Many such Krishna conscious children are required and one who is capable of bringing forth Krishna conscious offspring is allowed to utilize his genitals. So, having a Krishna conscious child, it's a very important service for our Krishna consciousness movement. We should understand, just like if you look at the Madhva and the Sri Vaishnavas and so on, their devotees, they're all from the family. It's in the family. Like their mother and father, their grandfather, and like, they were all Sri Vaishnavas or Madhva, Madhva Vaishnavas, whatever. They were, they were already, their family is in that line. And it's important that devotees, children should also become devotees. If you have children and they don't become devotees, then it's a great waste. What was the good of begetting a child if the child does not become a devotee? So this is very important that in the future our devotees will be the children of devotees. Mostly, most of the devotees in the future will be from devotee families. It's not, you, you don't see in the history of religion in the world, you don't see a lot of conversion going on for a long time bringing new people into a new religion, into a new faith, a new religion or whatever, it doesn't keep going for very long. Just like, you know, Sri Vaishnavas, they're not doing a lot of conversion. Mostly their devotees are from that line. Their family are in the, it's that. That's the way it is. And similarly, the Christians, you know, they were, they're all Christians, you know, their family were Christians and like that. They, they don't keep converting too many people. They're not able to convert people. And we don't know how long we can go on bringing in new devotees to Krishna consciousness. So, the children of our devotees are the future of our Krishna consciousness movement. And the children have to get properly trained and educated. And Prabhupada mentions here, in this time when Prabhupada wrote this book, at that time the children were all going to the Guru Kula in Dallas, in Texas. That stopped now. They don't do that now. Even in Prabhupada's time they stopped that. They moved everything from Dallas, they moved all the children to Vrindavan because there were difficulties in USA. There were difficulties with the government, the different authorities. It wasn't so easy to bring up children in the Gurukula, in the Gurukul system in USA. They still have a, a day school there at Dallas, Texas. And they have like the TKG Gurukula or something. But the children go home at night. And even nowadays, I was just there in Mayapur, I just came from Mayapur a little while ago, in Mayapur now they're planning that all the children up to the age of 16 will go home every night. They'll go home every night and stay with their family and they'll come in the daytime. Up to the age of 16 and after 16, then they, if they want, they can decide to move into the ashram and stay in the ashram. Now previously, 
it wasn't like that. Previously, they were having the children come and stay in the Gurukula, and they would stay, you know, young boys, five-year-old children even, they would be staying in the Gurukul, away from their homes, and they would be looked after by older boys. But it's very difficult and you get problems. And one of the problems is which comes, sometimes you get abuse. And that's very serious. You get people sometimes who they start abusing the children. And that, that happens in like the Catholic Church. It, happ it happens everywhere, not just in our movement. Don't think that it only happens in Krishna consciousness. It happens everywhere. Wherever you've got children and older people, that it's a problem. That's why we have the office now, they have a child protection office to protect, to protect the children and anybody who's found guilty of child abuse then it's very serious and maybe they're, they're not allowed to come to the temple, they're not allowed to, you know, have any, any connection at all with children of course. But the children are very important for our movement and we want to bring them up to be devotees. And Prabhupada also said he learned everything from his father. Before he, before he met Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he said, I learned everything from my father. His father had him learn to play the madanga and he was playing harmonium and he was seeing the deity worship and he was going to the temple and he was doing the Ratiatra. He said the only thing he learned which his father didn't do, which he learned from Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was? Oh, yes, printing books, writing and printing books. And Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he was also born in a Vaishnava family because he was brought up in the family of Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, or at that time Kedarnath Datta. So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati as a young boy, he'd already memorized the whole Bhagavad Gita. He'd already memorized all the slokas, all the verses, he studied all the scriptures because his father instilled in him all of this. So when you get children like that, you know, very special, very powerful. Just like they have a deity worship course in Mayapur, the deity worship course, it's open to people who are second initiated, but it's also open to people born in devotee families. Somebody born in a devotee family, that's better than being second initiated, because from birth they've been brought up as devotees. Mm -hmm. So, children are very, very important for our movement. They're the future. We give a lot of importance to training them. Prabhupada was very concerned about, he, he, he encouraged the devotees. When, the, when a, a girl would be pregnant, then Prabhupada would want to be very careful, take very good care of that child because these children who are born to devotees from the Bhagavad Gita, we learn that they were already advanced in yoga. So to be born in a devotee family, it means in their previous life, they were already advanced in yoga practice, but not quite successful. They didn't have enough to go back to Godhead but they're taking birth in a devotee family. So it's an opportunity, this should be their last birth. No more birth in the material world. They're born in the devotee family. It's a, such a birth is rare in this world. So we give great importance to bringing up children in Krishna consciousness and training them nicely to be devotees.
And we see some wonderful devotees. There were, there were some young men came to Mayapur. Uh, they were in Vrindavan. I asked, oh, they did kirtan. And they did this wonderful kirtan. It was just amazing. It was really wonderful. And I asked them, they were Western bodied men. And I asked them, how did you learn so much nice kirtan? They said, well, we were born in New Vrindavan. <laughs> They were brought, brought up in New Vrindavan. Their parents were devotees. So from their whole childhood they spent doing kirtan, you know, did a lot of kirtan. And they came, they were staying in Vrindavan, they came over to Mayapur, and their kirtan was just wonderful. You could tell, you can see, you know, because of their whole life, they've been in Krishna consciousness. Okay, when one is fully practiced in the methods of Krishna conscious control, he can become qualified to be a bona fide spiritual master. Right? You want to be a spirit? We need many spiritual masters. It's a service. And we need many spiritual masters. There's a great need. We don't have enough spiritual masters. We need many more. So you should all want to become spiritual masters. Go on and teach and give, you, give mercy to others. Okay, now we're going to hear Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati's commentary on this verse. This is called the Anuvriti Explanation of Upadesh Amrita. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Thakur writes that our material, our material identification creates three kinds of urges. The urge to speak, the urge or demands of the mind and the demands of the body. When a living entity falls victim to these three types of urges, his life becomes inauspicious. One who practices resisting these elements of these demands or urges is called a tapasvi or one who practices austerities. By such tapasya one can overcome victimization by the material energy, the external potency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So victimization by the material energy. We become victimized by the material energy. What will happen to us when we're victimized by the material energy? We lose the, we lose the taste to continue adding. Yeah. We think that we are this body. Yeah, we think we are the body. Yeah. The threefold misery and birth that yeah, but that's going to be there, yeah. Three arches. Huh? Three arches. Arch of tongue, arch of body, arch of mind. Yes, and so? Three arches. Are they going to be controlled? No, they're not going to be controlled, right? So we, we become victimized by the material energy. It means we will be put under the modes of nature. We will be suffering. Adi Kleshik, Adi Baltic, Adi Atmic, the different miseries which are there in the material energy. Suffering, it's all suffering. What is the cause of our suffering? Because we're trying to exploit the material energy. We're thinking this world is for my enjoyment. Huh? Apariyamitastranyam prakritim vidimai param jiva bhuta mahabaho yeyidam daryate jagat. This is it, right? Besides this material nature, Krishna had described the material nature, the elements of the material energy. There is another energy of mind which are all living entities. And what are they trying to do? What are the living entities trying to do? They're trying to serve Krishna. Krishna is all material. Huh? They're trying to exploit the 
resources of the material world. Because we are the paraprakriti, we are the superior prakriti. So we are thinking that apara prakriti, the material nature, is all there for me to enjoy. Right? We're not thinking there's a purusha above the prakriti. We're thinking we're the purush. <laughs> Right? But actually, we are not, we are Prakriti, we are not Purush. But we are thinking we are Prakriti. We are thinking we are the Purush. And we are thinking that Prakriti is all there for us to take. What's the difference between the two Prakritis? The inferior Prakriti and the superior Prakriti? What is the difference? Move itself. So the mm. it move. Yes, why can it not move? It's yes, it has no consciousness. There's no consciousness in this table. Right? The microphone is not conscious. But the, the mosquito is conscious. Mm -hmm. The flies are conscious. <laughs> you know, we are conscious. Why? Because there's a superior prakriti there. And that's the, where the consciousness is coming. Right? So superior prakriti. Mm. When we refer to the urge to speak, we refer to useless talking, such as that of the impersonal Mayavadi philosophers or of persons engaged in fruitive activities, technically called karmakanda or of materialistic people who simply want to enjoy life without restriction. All such talks or literatures are practical, are practical exhibitions of the urge to speak. Many people are talking nonsensically and writing volumes of useless books and all this is the result of the urge to speak. To counteract this tendency, we have to divert our talking to the subject of Krishna. This is explained in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And then Prabhupada quotes the verse, famous verse, from the first canto, fifth chapter, where Srila Narada Muni is instructing Vyasadeva. Nayadvichas chitrapadam harayasu jagat pavritam pagriniti tadvayasam ushanti manasa nayatra hamsa niramanti ushiksha. Those words which do not describe the glories of the Lord who alone can sanctify the atmosphere of the whole universe are considered by saintly persons to be what? Those words which do not glorify the Lord, they are compared to what place? Yes, the place of pilgrimage for crows. We see a lot of crows in India, <laughs> especially when you're in the city. You see the crows. Wow. Since the all perfect persons are inhabitants of the transcendental abode, they do not derive any pleasure there. Right? We don't get any pleasure in the place of pure. What is the place? Where do the crows get their pleasure? Garbage. In the garbage, right. If there's a dead rat, Wow, the crows will all come, they will have a feast to eat the dead rat. So, <laughs> the all-perfect persons are inhabitants of the transcendental abode. We do, there's a big difference between these people and the devotees. Okay, and then Prabhupada quotes the next verse. Tad Tadvagvishargo janata gaviplavo yasin pradishto tamatar gyadhyavi 
On the other hand, that literature which is full of descriptions of the transcendental glories of the name, fame, forms, pastimes, etc., of the unlimited Supreme Lord is a different creation, full of transcendental words directed towards bringing about a revolution in the impious lives of the world's misdirected civilization. Such transcendental literatures, even though imperfectly composed, are heard, sung and accepted by purified men who are thoroughly honest. So, very nice, two very nice important verses there, which are in relation to controlling the urge to speak. The, the literatures also are just also prajalpa, garbage, so much garbage literatures. And you can see so many, you go to the bookstores or any news stall magazine, you see all the garbage, the newspapers every day, full of so much nonsense. So, this is, this is all for the, the crows, the place of pilgrimage of the crows. So Prabhupada says, the conclusion is that only when we talk about devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead can we refrain from useless, nonsensical talk. We should always endeavor to use our speaking power solely for the purpose of realizing Krishna Consciousness. Uh, His Holiness Bhaktivikas Swami Maharaj wrote a little book about a person called Vamsi Das Babaji. Vamsi Das Babaji was a contemporary in the times of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur and he was a great, he was a Babaji, he was a great, greatly renounced personality and he would talk to his deities, it was custom that he would talk with his deities. So uh, sometimes people would come to him and they would say things like, what do you think of the government? And he would say, Govardhan? <laughs> he wouldn't want to talk about the government. He would just say, Govardhan? <laughs> so, change the topic, right? That's uh, the expert devotee, you see? We, why should we, just like when people would come to Prabhupada, sometimes they'd come to Prabhupada, they'd say to Prabhupada, Swamiji, how old are you? He would say, I am the same age as you. <laughs> huh? <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada would bring them to a higher level, you see. And Prabhupada would explain, yes, I'm the same age as you. I'm an eternal soul, and you are also an eternal soul. You see? <laughs> Often people would come to us, when we were doing Sankirtan in London, in England, they would ask us, where is, and they would ask us some place, you know, and we'd always say, oh, go to this place there. We'd send them to the temple. <laughs> Whatever, whatever they wanted, something that where's the museum, where's this, where's that. Okay, just go there, go up the stairs there and then <laughs> send them to the temple. We don't want to get involved in anything mundane, you know. And, and the, I was in there, coming up off the flight, and the man, a man was there, some man said to me, he said, well, where are you from? I said, I'm from Krishna. He said, oh, 
<laughs> but really, uh, yeah, I know Krishna, but where did he come from? You know, I said, well, originally we're all from Goloka. You know, we're all we're all pure spiritual beings, and we all come from the spiritual world. It's going, oh. <laughs> You know, we don't need to get involved in mundane talking if we don't want to. We have to learn to elevate people, bring people to Krishna consciousness, and get them to understand. So changing the topic, this is something we have to practice, certainly possible. We like to speak about Krishna. Nonsense talk will breed nonsense thought. And nonsense thought will cause nonsense action. And nonsense actions will mean, again, birth and death. So we should be very careful to utilize our body, mind and senses in the service of Krishna. All right, then Prabhupada continues, As for the agitations of the flickering mind, they are divided into two divisions. The first is called Aviroda Priti, or unrestricted attachment. And the other is called Viroda Yukta Kroda, anger arising from frustration. Anger arising from frustration. Remember, I described that gates to hell, right? Three gates to hell. That's anger and greed. Right. So then begins with lust. And you, 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 you don't get what you want. What happens? Anger, right? Frustration. You didn't get what you wanted. <laughs> Become so angry. Mm. So that's the, the attachment. Adherence to the philosophy of the Mayavadi belief in the fruit of results of the Karma Kandis and belief in plans based on materialistic desires are called Avirodha Priti. Jnanis karmis and materialistic plan makers primarily attract the attention of conditioned souls. But when the materialists cannot fulfill their plans and when their desires, when their devices are, well, when their devices are frustrated, they become angry. Frustration of material desire produces anger. Right? Anger is the younger brother of lust. It's all material desires is lust. We don't get, we're not able to satisfy our material desires, the cause of anger. So Prabhupada talks about these different people, the Mayavadis, the Karmis, Karmakandi people, the people attached to sense gratification, but they're all engaged in different kinds of activities just for satisfying their plans. Whatever plan man makes, what will happen? Whatever plan man makes, Maya will destroy it. You have to be careful. They'll make a plan to surrender to Krishna. Maya cannot destroy that. Similarly, the demands of the body can be divided into three categories. The demands of the tongue, the belly, and the genitals. One may observe that these three senses are physically situated in a straight line. As far as the body is concerned, 
and that the the the, the bodily demands begin with the tongue. If one can restrain the demands of the tongue by limiting its activities to the eating of prasad, the urges of the belly and the genitals can automatically be controlled. In this connection, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, and Prabhupada quotes, the wake-up prayer. You know the wake-up prayer? Sharira Vijaja, yeah, like that. The wake up prayer, you know, whenever you say Sharira, huh? <laughs> just hear the magic words and immediately every, what? You know, Prasadam, you know? Immediately every, and as soon as we say Om Namo Bhagavate, we go to sleep prayer. <laughs> So different prayers, you know. So, the, of course that prayer which we say before taking prasadam, it's, it's important because it takes away our material conception when we honor prasadam. We should understand that we're not simply eating prasadam, we're honoring prasadam. And we, ha we do have material conceptions about it. Oh, what's for prasad? Oh, oh, I like that. Oh, I don't like that. You know, we have our material conceptions. When, when they would distribute Prabhupada's remnants, they would merge it all together. Prabhupada would say, mix it all up. <laughs> <laughs> so they mixed up the salty and the sweet and everything would all get mixed up. And then, you, because if you don't mix up, people say, give me that, give me that. <laughs> material conceptions. We shouldn't have material conception about prasada. Prasada is spiritual. And we have to honor it with the proper consciousness. <coughs> so Bhaktivinoda Thakur gave us this very nice prayer. Of all the senses, the tongue is the most voracious and difficult to control. But you, dear Lord Krishna, have been so kind. You have given us this nice prasadam. So now let us take this prasadam to our full satisfaction and by so doing glorify the Lordship Sri Sri Radha and Krishna and in love call out for the mercy of Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda. All right, so honoring prasadam, uh, there was a one time in the nectar of devotion it says, you should only take prasadam when the spiritual master calls you. So there was one devotee, Upendra Prabhu, he was Prabhupada's servant. So uh, he stopped taking prasadam. So Prabhupada said, why are you not taking prasadam? He said, Prabhupada, you didn't call me. Yeah. And Prabhupada said, I'm always calling you, come and take prasad. So, yeah, you know, we should take prasadam. Just like we, are, we say, regulated times, proper time. Prabhupada liked us to take prasadam, liked to see us honor prasadam, liked to see us happy, in taking prasadam. And Prabhupada taught us, he said, like, during the week we take rice, dal, chapati, sabji, and on the week, one day a week we have a feast, like Sunday feast. One day a week opulent, a little opulent. Halava, sweet rice, maybe samosa, bakura, <laughs> these things, eh? cook a nice something more a little more opulent and that way everybody's happy everybody's satisfied once a week but if every day you eat these kind of things it's not very good you know it won't be good for your health it won't be good for your senses either <laughs> you have to be we have to be careful 
So we're going to hear about this. Prabhupada is going to talk about taking prasadam here. There are six kinds of rasas or tastes. And if one is agitated by one of them, he becomes controlled by the urges of the tongue. Some persons are attracted to the eating of meat, fish, crabs, eggs, and other things produced by, produced by semen and blood and eaten in the form of dead bodies. Others are attached to eating vegetables, creepers, spinach or milk products, but all for the satisfaction of the tongue's demands. Such eating for sense gratification, including the use of extra quality quantities of spices like chili and tamarind, is to be given up by Krishna conscious persons. Tamarind, oh, tamarind rice, oh. I, one, one of the devotees from Malaysia, he told me, he, he, <laughs> he would, because he's from Malaysia, and Malaysians are Tamils, they like also tamarind things, tamarind rice. And what happened was he went to Australia to study, to do postgraduates. He says the hardest thing was no tamarind rice. <laughs> <laughs> to be away from the tamarind rice was unbearable. Oh, agony. <laughs> <laughs> Do you people take tamarind rice? Uh -uh. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right, yeah. The, tam the Tamils take it. You're not Tamils, that's the thing. And the use of pan, haritake, betel nuts, various spices used in pan making, tobacco, LSD, marijuana, <laughs> opium, liquor, coffee, and tea is prohibited, is indulging. Oh. is indulging in to fulfill illicit demands. If we can practice acquire, if we can practice accepting only remnants of food offered to Krishna, it is possible to get free from Maya's victimization. So, pan, haritaki, Lord Chaitanya would take these things. Lord Nityananda, there's a story, there was this one devotee, Govinda Ghosh. You know Govinda Ghosh? You know that story about Govinda Ghosh? Anyway, Govinda Ghosh, he was with, he was traveling with Lord Nityananda and Lord Nityananda's party. And uh, I think, it, he, he, Lord Nityananda wanted a haritaki. He said, I'd like to have some haritaki. And Govinda Ghosh said, oh, I have some, I have haritaki. And he pulled out some haritaki. So Lord Nityananda looked, he was surprised. He said, oh, you're so attached. You keep the haritaki with you. <laughs> he, said, he said, you're not meant for renounced life. You should go and get married. <laughs> He was a single man at the time, you know, but because he was keeping Haritaki, because he was keeping something like, you know, Haritaki, which, something which they, they suck on, they enjoy tasting, and then they said, better you go and get married, you're not meant for renounced life. You're not supposed to keep things. Sannyasis not supposed to keep a lot of food or things like that, you know. They're not to Ramachandra Puri came to visit Lord Chaitanya in Jagannath Puri 
and he saw insects on the floor, many ants. He said, ah, look, insects, ants. Means you were keeping sweets here. <laughs> Must have been you were keeping. He said, I heard about you, Gaudiya Vaishnavas. You all eat too much. Now I can see it's true. That's why all these insects are coming. You must be keeping sweets and crumbs of food are here. And that's why all the insects are coming. And when Lord Chaitanya heard like that, Lord Chaitanya ordered his servant Govinda. He said, from today on, reduce my food to one-fourth of the normal quantity. So all the devotees were really hurt because Lord Chaitanya was reducing his eating just because of the criticism of this Ramachandra Puri. Ramachandra Puri was a fault finder. So anyway, and Govinda Ghosh had this Haritaki. <laughs> they told him, you have to go and get married just because he was keeping, storing, accumulating unnecessarily. So you have to get married. And then when he got married, then what happened was there was no child and they thought, how will, how will if, if, if there's no child, who will do the last rites? So they said, the deity will do it for you. So that was the case, the deity actually did the last rites. When he left the body, the deity was the one who lit the fire to burn the body. Hmm. So that deity is there, still there, Govinda Ghosh. So we're warned, don't accumulate, don't stir, save up things, you know. Some, <laughs> Sometimes you go to somebody's home, you know, and they open the fridge and they go, Oh, I've got the prasadam from three weeks ago and I've got this from uh, when I went to Jagannath Puri and this is the prasad from Tirupati, you know. <laughs> and they've got them all in the fridge, you know, <laughs> like months old, you know. <laughs> we shouldn't do these things, you know. We should distribute. We, we get prasadam, distribute it, right? And even if nobody wants it, feed it to the dogs or put it on, out for the animals, the plants, the insects to come or the jackals. <laughs> but don't, don't just accumulate it. Don't just keep it. It is possible to get free from the maya victimization. Uh, vegetables, grains, Fruits, milk products and water are proper foods to offer to the Lord as Lord Krishna himself prescribes. However, if one accepts prasad only because of its palatable taste and, and thus eats too much, he also falls prey to trying to satisfy the demands of the tongue. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught, taught us to avoid very palatable dishes even while eating prasadam. This was, Prabhupada is quoting actually, this is in relation to Raghunath Das. Raghunath Das Goswami. Now Raghunath Das had come from a very wealthy fan family and you know how he'd run away from home. His family always tried to bring him back. He was very, his father was very, very, very rich and his uncle, they were both very rich and they got him married to the very beautiful young girl but he wasn't interested. He wasn't interested. He didn't want material life. He wanted to be a full-time devotee. He wanted to go and join the Krishna Consciousness Movement in Jagannath Puri with Lord Chaitanya. So finally he got the blessings of Lord Nityananda 
when he went to Panihati, he did the Panihati Shira Dahi festival and Lord Nityananda blessed him. And a short time later, he managed to get away from home and he went to Jagannath Puri and became a member there under Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya gave him to Swarup Damodar. Swarup Damodar Goswami would take care of him. And if Raghunath Das had any question to ask, he would go to Swarup Damodar. And Swarup Damodar would ask Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He wouldn't go directly. But it happened that he asked about what should he do, what should his service be. So Lord Chaitanya gave him the instruction. He said, do not hear worldly talk and do not talk like the ordinary people. Don't hear the Gramya Kata and don't talk like these people either. And then he also told them, don't eat palatable food and don't dress in a luxurious manner. He's a, because he's, a, he's not a sannyasi, but he's a Babaji. Babaji's are above sannyasis. Sannyasis are on the material platform, but the Babaji is completely transcendental, Trans fully uh, above the material energy, Paramahamsas, to come to that level of Babaji. They wear white, right? right? Like all of you, right? most of you, you're in white. White is the color of the Babaji, the fully renounced person. And uh, they, of course they wear the, the short dhoti down to the knees. And so Raghunath Das was going to become like that. Ra Lord Chaitanya told him, don't eat opulently and don't dress luxuriously. But especially also, don't talk like ordinary people, and don't hear what they have to say also. This, were, this was Lord Chaitanya's instructions to Raghunath Das Goswami. So Prabhupada is quoting that here, that Lord Chaitanya said, avoid palatable dishes. If we offer palatable dishes to the deity, with the intention of eating such nice food, then we are involved in trying to satisfy the demands of the tongue. If we accept the invitation of a rich man with the idea of receiving palatable food, we are also trying to satisfy the demands of the tongue. So, the, of course, this is a common thing, right? You have, if you're uh, doing life mem, do you make life members still here? No? Yes, you do. So sometimes, and some, of course, you have many people who are already members, and sometimes they invite you to their home. They want to do a program, they want to do some punya, and they want the devotees to come to their home. So it's difficult. They want you to come, they're happy if you will eat, and we're not happy to eat. We don't want to eat. We want to go and preach, but they want us to come and eat. So, somehow you have to balance it. You have to tell them beforehand, we don't eat at night. <laughs> You can do things like, you can tell them that before you go, yeah, we will come to your home, but we don't eat at night. Or, we will, we will only eat fruit and milk. Something like this. You know? And you can give some sweets if you want. We can take them back and eat them the next day. <laughs> Something like this, you know. You have to be careful. We don't go to people's homes just to eat because you get their karma. They want you to come and eat to take away their karma. We don't want their karma. 
why should we take their karma? Now, they're not chanting 16 rounds, they're not initiated devotees. They're life members, they're supporters of our Krishna consciousness movement, but at the same time, they're not full-on devotees. So, we can bring the food from the temple, that's also possible. You see, we will, we will cook the food at the temple and bring it. And you can pay for it to the temple. You can do that. These are some practical solutions to that situation. But we have to be very cautious because sometimes we think, oh, we're going to a program, that man is going to give us very nice prasadam, you know. Ah, oh, it will be very good, yeah. There will be halava and kachuri and samosa and so many sweets and oh, yeah. <laughs> and if we're thinking like that, then this is serving the tongue. This is not, not good. This is not the proper mood. And similarly, we cook something for the deity, but we're thinking, I will enjoy it. I will eat it. People offer nice things to the deity, then they should distribute it. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the third canto, teachings of Lord Kapila describes if you worship the deity and you offer things to the deity just for your own self, then you're only a little better than the ordinary karmi. What we should do when we worship the deity, we offer food to the deity, then we should distribute it to the people. It's not just for our own self to eat. If we simply eat it ourselves, that is the demands of the tongue, the urge of the tongue. Simply we're serving the tongue. So then Prabhupada quotes the Chaitanya Charitamrita, a verse from the Anjali Leela. That person who runs here and there seeking to gratify his palate and who is always attached to the desires of his stomach and genitals is unable to attain Krishna. So, that's the result. You just serve the tongue and the genitals, then you won't get to Krishna. You won't go back to God. You may say, I'm not breaking any regulative principles. Yes, we're not breaking any regulative principles. That's true. But we're not cultivating the proper mood of devotion. It's the demand of our tongue. We're serving the tongue. We're not serving Krishna. We're thinking what I like, not what Krishna likes. As stated before, the tongue, the belly and genitals are all in a straight line and they fall in the same category. Lord Chaitanya has said, do not dress luxuriously and do not eat delicious foodstuff. Anchilila, chapter 6, 236. That's Lord Chaitanya's instructions to Raghunath Das Goswami. Now Raghunath Das Goswami is a complete renunciate. So, you know, we cannot make that a general rule. Why do we dress? But you know, we're encouraged to dress nicely. We could say, is this against Lord Chaitanya's rule? Lord Chaitanya said, do not dress luxuriously. What about us? Should we dress luxuriously or not? What do you think? For preaching, we can. For preaching, we have to be respectable, we have to be clean and neat, tidy. Prabhupada liked to see the devotees 
dressed nicely. If we just go in rags, <laughs> it's not very good. Right? Because we are quite a wealthy movement, we have temples, we have properties, vehicle, and if we go around in rags, it doesn't look very good. And so we have to dress properly for the public opinion. Right? There's two considerations. There's the on one side we have our sadhana, and the other side the public opinion. So public opinion is important. We have to think about that. Raghunath Daskaswami, he's going to live in Vrindavan. In Vrindavan in those days, 500 years ago, there were no temples. There was no, no Moi Bazaar. <laughs> there were none of these sweet shops or anything. There was just a few bridge bassy farmers. And so it's a little different, quite different, totally different. You go to live in Vrindavan, you don't dress opulently. You've, re you've renounced, you've given up all kinds of attachment. So dressing very simply. And do not eat delicious foods. You still eat. Of course, Raghunath Dath Goswami, he was so renounced that sometimes he would forget to eat. He was so absorbed in Krishna consciousness, they would just forget to eat. They'd be chanting, they'd be dancing, they'd be going to visit different places. They wouldn't even think about eating. We're not so much on that level. Probably, I don't know about you, but I know I'm not fully on that level, that you can go without eating. And he would just take a little bit of buttermilk sometimes. He would like that. He's so renounced. So, we have to understand these teachings and how to apply them. Those who suffer from diseases of the stomach must be unable to control the urges of the belly, <laughs> at least according to this analysis. When we desire to eat more basic, when we desire to eat more than necessary, we automatically create many inconveniences in life. However, if we observe fasting days like Ekadasi and Janmastami, we can restrain the demands of the belly. So fasting on Ekadasi, certainly observing the Ekadasi fast is good for us. You don't have to do full fast, but don't eat more. Usually the way it was in Prabhupada's time, we would only take prasadam one time on a courtesy. We'd take in the midday. We wouldn't have breakfast. And everybody was told to chant 25 rounds. So, these are some things. A courtesy. Mm. Prabhupada would take prasadam on a karasi, take a karasi prasadam, simple prasadam. But Prabhupada sometimes also liked to cook a feast for the devotees, especially when we have a lot of younger devotees. Prabhupada would say, old man cannot eat too little, young man cannot eat too much. The young men can eat as much as they want because they're young. The body's young, they can digest it. But the old man, the less he eats, the better. Hmm. Prabhupada used to tell us all these things. <laughs> now I'm seeing the, the logic of it. It's certainly true. In old age, you cannot eat, you cannot enjoy. When you're young, you can eat so much, you know, you can enjoy so many things. Halava, chapatis, and so many you can eat. 
but then in old age, you know, you, you can't, can't do it. So fasting on the Kadasi gives the stomach a rest. You see, it's 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 part of the. It's good for health. Of course, Kadasi is a day which is good dear to Krishna, and Prabhupada taught us the real purpose of Kadasi is to increase our hearing and chanting and remembrance of Krishna. But even on a material platform, Ekadasi is good for us because it gives the body a chance to rest. Because every day we're eating and digesting, eating and digest. The body's working and the body gets tired. Just like devotees, if we're working all day, every day, sometimes we need a break. We need, a, we need to rest and just concentrate on reading or, or maybe go to the dam or something like that, you know, a little break. So the, the, we need a rest the same way the organs in our body need a rest. And that day is ekadasi. Let the body rest a little bit on ekadasi. Don't eat so much on ekadasi. Don't eat heavy food. Keep it light. As far as the urges of the genitals are concerned, there are two, proper and improper, or legal and illicit sex. When a man is properly mature, he can marry according to the rules and regulations of the Shastra, and use his genitals to beget nice children. That is legal and religious. Otherwise, he may adopt many artificial means to satisfy the demands of the genitals, and he may not use any restraint. When one indulges in illicit sex, as defined by the Shastras, either by thinking, planning, talking about or actually having sexual intercourse or by satisfying the genitals by artificial means, he is caught in the clutches of maya. These instructions apply not only to householders but also to tyagis or those who are in the renounced order of life. So, important instructions, what it means to be actually brahmachari, right? We don't talk about these things, we don't uh, think about it, don't talk about it, you don't even, you can see here, there's no women here also, out of sight, out of mind, right? It's a healthy situation. You're very lucky in India, you know. I was talking to Kavi Chandra Swami. Kavi Chandra Swami, I said to him, I said, Maharaj, there's so many young men here in the temples in India. Everywhere else you go, it's young women. There's no men. <laughs> it's very difficult to get men. In India, it's very good to get men. But outside of India, very difficult to get men. Very difficult. We get a lot of women, young women. You go to England, you go to, uh, you go to, he was in Israel, he was telling me Israel, it's a lot of women. I, 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 you go to China, we have mostly women. Thailand, we have a lot of women also. Uh, you, you, you get more, you know, it's difficult to get men. But in India, you're so lucky, we get a lot of nice young men come. It's a healthy situation. So it makes it much easier to practice brahmacharya life. But still, the tendency is there. Sometimes people nowadays, we, everybody has a mobile phone and you have your 4G, you know, and with 4G, you know, you're more flexible and you go to the movies and 
Is, you know, you're not just using the mobile phone for congregational preaching. But, you know, people are doing things like, oh, you're listening to some bhajan, and then they start listening to some Bollywood movie, and, and, and once you get into that kind of thing, then, it's, you know, the mind goes out of control, and you start to think about Maybe I need to get married. <laughs> People start to think about changing that ashram or something. So, you have to follow the process. It's all right, yeah? Get married, it's, that's honest. Become an honest householder. Nothing, we said it, that is the safest ashram, householder life. To be married is safe, you're secure, because you have a, a, a wife at home, so you're safe. But sannyasis, brahmacharis, not so safe. Anytime we can be victim of the material energy. So we have to be very careful to avoid these kind of situations which will disturb the mind and agitate us. These instructions apply not only to householders, but also to those in the renounced order of life. In his book, Prima Vivarta, Jagadananda Pandit says, and we'll hear what Jagadananda Pandit says, My dear brother, you are in the renounced order of life and should not listen to talk about ordinary worldly things. Nor should you talk about worldly things when you meet with others. Do not think of women even in dreams. You have accepted the renounced order of life with a vow that forbids you to associate with women. If you wish to associate with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you must always remember the incident of Chota Haridas and how he was rejected by the Lord. Do not eat luxurious dishes or dress in fine garments, but always remain humble and serve their Lordship Sri Sri Radha Krishna in your heart of hearts. So Jagannananda Pandit describes there how Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu rejected Chota Haridas. Chota Haridas had gone to beg some rice. The, some devotee was cooking for Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and they needed some special rice. So Chota Haridas went to get it and he went to get it, he went to Madhava Devi to get the rice. It was an elderly woman, but he brought the rice back and when they brought the rice, they cooked it and they served it to Lord Chaitanya. And Lord Chaitanya said, oh, this is very nice. Where did you get this from? And they said, oh, uh, Chota Haridas went to get it. He got it from Madhava Devi, Madhavi Devi. So Lord Chaitanya said, oh, really? And he didn't see any more. But then later that day, he said, tell Chota Haridas, I do not want to see him again. He cannot come in my association again. So everyone was shocked. And nobody knew what had happened. And they even pleaded with Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that please forgive him. But Lord Chaitanya said, no, I cannot forgive him. He said, if you, can, if you continue to insist on this, then I will leave here and you will never see me again. So when Lord Chaitanya said like that, then they all kept quiet. Anyway, Eventually, Chota Haridas decided 
that he had to enter into the the tree the Triveni where the Ganga and the Yamuna meets and he entered there and gave up his body. And when Lord Chaitanya heard, then Lord Chaitanya said, this is the proper atonement for somebody who breaks or who deviates from the principles of renunciation. So Lord Chaitanya was actually pleased that he had done that, that he had given up his body in that way. And Lord Chaitanya accepted him as his eternal associate. So this incident is described in the Chaitanya Charitamrita to remind everyone of how strict Lord Chaitanya was. Very, very strict. But at the same time, he could be like a rose, like a thunderbolt and like a rose. Both very sweet and sometimes very hard. Mm. A devotee was talking, I was telling you yesterday, I was watching this devotee talking about the qualities, the 26 qualities of Prabhupada or qualities of pure devotees and one of them was perfect gentleman. So one devotee, there was this one sannyasi, Sundar Govinda Maharaj and he was from South America and he was talking about Prabhupada, how Prabhupada was watching a drama in the New York temple. New York temple, the Brooklyn temple, they had a number of very, very expert uh, actors and actresses and they did some very nice dramas. I was able to be present one time when Prabhupada was there and I know Prabhupada watched. They did, I, I think it was the kidnapping of Rukmini and, and Prabhupada said, oh this drama is better than my book. <laughs> <laughs> better than the books, he said, watching the drama. He enjoyed so there was another drama they were doing. This was, at this time they were living in Manhattan and for some time, for some years, in Prabhupada's time also, we purchased this big skyscraper building in Manhattan. It had about 15 floors or more. And one of the floors there was a theater which could hold like 700 people. So they they had the Vaikuntha players. The Vaikuntha players was the name of the drama group. The devotees would do these dramas. And they had the, uh, one of the actors was Sudama Swami. And Sudama Swami was the age of Kali. He was the personality of Kali. You know, he had, the, he had a big hat on, you know. And <laughs> he was playing the personality of Kali. And the, and, but at one point, this woman came on. Her name was Rasatna and, and she was an actress and she was, she was a very attractive woman. And she came walking on the stage and Prabhupada was sitting there with the sannyasis and the sannyasis were up. <laughs> you know, they all put their heads down, you know, they didn't want to look at the because she's very attractive, you know, very but Prabhupada was watching and smiling and you know. and afterwards he, he talked about it. And he said to the devotee, he said, the devotee sees the beautiful woman, it's not that he thinks that he will enjoy the woman, but he understands this is the creation of Krishna. That the, the beauty of the body is the creation of Krishna. So they see everything in relation to Krishna. It's not that you can't look. In Buddhism also, in Buddhism they have, if you're a young monk, you should look down. Don't look at the woman, you know, look down. <laughs> they train the monks like that. But Prabhupada tell, told the devotees, he said, when the devotee sees a beautiful woman, he thinks the creation of Krishna, that her beauty is by Krishna. Krishna is the creator. So like that. We can, in this way, you can develop the detachment, not 
for our own enjoyment. So, uh, Jagadananda Pandit is writing about Chota Haridas. He committed some offense. I can't remember exactly what it was he did, but there was something wrong. There was some little deviation which he made there, which he shouldn't have done in the Ramana's order. And so Lord Chaitanya rejected him. So this is a warning. Mm. That it's, it's, it's a serious commitment to accept the renounced order of life. Of course, in Prabhupada's time, sometimes there would be people who take sannyas who would have difficulties, who would fall down even. And Prabhupada would encourage them, then get married. You know, they, they were young men and they tried to renounce. So to try to renounce prematurely is very dangerous, you know, if you're still very... Prabhupada, because Prabhupada's time, most of the men were young. We didn't have a lot of old men. We just had young men. And Prabhupada needs sannyasis. He needs sannyasis to lead, to be the leaders, to go out and do the preaching and to lead and give the classes and inspire the devotees. They, they needed to have sannyasi. So Prabhupada gave sannyas to people. There was one year, 1976, Prabhupada gave sannyas seven men. So one of Prabhupada's friends was there. And uh, he said to Prabhupada, he watched Prabhupada give them all sannyas. And then he said to Prabhupada, he said, he said, Oh, Prabhupada, he said, they're all very young. They're all very young men to take sannyas. But Prabhupada said to him, he said, if we wait till they're old, what can they do? <laughs> right? When you're old, you can't do so much. So Prabhupada gave them the chance. Let them take sannyas while they're young. But we saw also Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya when Lord Chaitanya came as a sannyasi at Jagannath Puri. What age was Lord Chaitanya when he took sannyas? 24. 24. Right? Right? What age are you? 90. You've got five years, right? <laughs> five years. You've still got five years to prepare for before you take sannyas, okay? <laughs> Lord Chaitanya took at 24, so he was young. And Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya saw, not only is he young, but he was very handsome. He was very tall, good looking. And Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya thought, well, it would be very difficult for him to maintain sannyas. So he thought, I have to help him, I will teach him Vedanta. Because if you have a good knowledge, then you can control your mind. Uh, there's a, there's a, His Holiness Yadunanda Swami, an Iskon Sanyasi. You know Yadunanda Swami? Yeah. Okay, Yadunanda Swami. He wrote a book because he was he took a master's degree, and for his master's degree, he had to write a paper. So he wrote a paper about the, the, the problems of sannyas in ISKCON and why people give it up, you know. And so in the, in the book he talks about another book, that he read another book where it, uh, one, one man was uh, approaching his guru for sannyas. And, and he said to him, he said, now, he said, now you want to renounce. He said, but you're only in your mid-twenties. He said, when you, when you come to mid-forties, will you still have that same mood? Will you still have that same mood? Will you still want to renounce? And sometimes it, it happens that people, when they're twenty or something like that, Sanyas, I want to renounce. Eh? And th but then when they get to 40, 
I, I, I think I want to get married, you know, I've never been married before. <laughs> and it happens, you know, it happens, it's, it's amazing, but th this is how Maya works. So we try to be very careful in ISKCON, they're really strict now about sannyas. It's easier to be a guru than to be a sannyasi. <laughs> They're so strict, they have so many procedures you have to go through, you have to register and go to classes and courses and take a lot of training and things. So many, so many procedures are required before they agree to approve your sannyas. Because they don't want fall downs. That's the reason. They want to try to preserve the image of the renounced order. So we should have many more sannyasis actually in ISKCON. We need more, but there's not very many. Gradually the more will come. There's a lot of people waiting. So they have a policy also, Prabhupada gave sannyas to young men because they were not old men. But now they have the policy, you must be at least 40 before you get sannyas. So you've got 21 years to wait before you can take it. <laughs> you know? Because you have to be 40 before they'll even consider you for sannyas. Because then you might, you, by the time you get to 40, people's minds are a bit settled, you know, you... <laughs> but still, even you get people, even in older age, they, not, they somehow, their minds change. So it's a dangerous situation, you have to be very cautious. And you have to have, that's why it's very good, we want all the sannyasis, they study Bhakti Vaibhav, study Srimad Bhagavatam very carefully and so on. They have a good knowledge, a good grasp of the philosophy and keep themselves steady and strong in Krishna consciousness. Mm. So the number of fall downs in recent times in our Krishna consciousness movement is not very big. In the past there were a number of you know, from ta Prabhupada's time, because Prabhupada had given many young men and it was difficult for them to maintain. Like Jayapataka Swami Maharaj, he took sannyas when he was 19, 19 years of age. He'd been in the movement maybe one, just one year or two years <laughs> and he took sannyas. But he maintained and kept his sannyas. He's very He's very learned. He knows very, the philosophy very well. He's very well read. And he's very careful in dealing with everything. Okay, any questions? Who wants to take sannyas? Maharaj, you mentioned that uh, uh, ISKCON is a very wealthy movement, uh, so that we have to do for the preaching. So when we go out for begging, we go out for book distribution or making my life members in that way. So people say ISKCON, is, ISKCON already has a lot of money, so I won't give here. I will give to some other organization who really requires or needs the money. So what we can do in this situation? Yeah, you may give the money to some organization, but what are they going to do with your money? How are they going to use it? ISKCON will use your money in a proper manner. You can be sure. ISKCON is a wealthy organization because we, util we utilize the wealth very carefully. The other organizations, you don't know what's going on with their wealth. They may have a lot of wealth, but they're not using it properly. ISKCON uses the money properly. I don't have any money myself. I don't have a bank account. I have no money. I'm not taking the money for myself, we're taking the money from you to, to give to Krishna 
and you're getting benefit also when you give to ISKCON your money is going directly to the service of Krishna you're getting the greatest benefit you give your money to some other organization I don't know what benefit you're going to get you're not going to get any benefit you give it to these other people what are they going to do with your money you won't get benefit from them but you give it to ISKCON you can be sure you'll get benefit you get solid benefit And with that, we're giving you the book also. That's a, an opportunity for you to be greatly benefited. Yeah, we don't need your money. You don't want to give money, it's up to you. There are other people and they're giving money and they're happy to give money. And they give again and again because they're happy, because they see how ISKCON is using the money. We're not using the money for our own sense gratification. We're very careful. We don't let corruption go on. The, the money is not being filtered out into other people's pockets. It's all being used very carefully. Nothing is being wasted. Every day we are distributing prasadam food to so many people. Every day we are doing so many nice programs of preaching Krishna consciousness. You don't want to give your hard-earned money for us? That's, your, that's up to you. You have that choice. When you give it to some other people, you think they're going to give you any benefit? We don't think so. If they're going to give you what benefit? They simply take your money. You don't know what will happen to it, where it will go. But you give it to Krishna. Actually, money belongs to Krishna. Krishna gave you the money. You should pay your tax to Krishna. It's your duty to give back to Krishna. Krishna gave you that money. You should give something back in service to Krishna. Then you have to speak strongly. You have to convince them. I don't need your money. I can get money myself. I can work. I can make a job. But I'm doing service for Krishna. And you should also do some service for Krishna. I'm coming to you to give you a chance to do some service for Krishna to engage your hard-earned money in Krishna, in Krishna's service. You should take the opportunity. And whatever you give for the service of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, it will come back many, many times. Many people have that experience. They know by giving to Krishna, they're never the loser. We have to speak to them. We have to tell them the truth. What is the real situation? People should, they're, they're beginning to appreciate more our Krishna consciousness movement. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, but just a little bit more to finish this first text. So we'll just read it here. The conclusion is that one who can control these six items, speech, mind, anger, tongue, belly, and genitals, is to be called a Swami or Goswami. Swami means master. And Goswami means master of the go or senses. When one accepts the renounced order of life, he automatically assumes the title of Swami. This, commun this, oh, this does not mean that he is the master of the, fam of the family, community or society. He must be master of his senses. Unless one is master of the senses, he should not be called Goswami, but Godas, servant of the senses. Following in the footsteps of the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, 
all Swamis and Goswamis should fully engage in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. As opposed to this, the Godas engage in the service of the senses or in the service of the material world. They have no other engagement. Prahlad Maharaj has further described the Godas as Adarta Go, which refers to one whose senses are not controlled. The Adanta Go cannot become a servant of Krishna. In Srimad Bhagavatam, Prahlad Maharaj has said, Materna Krishna Yes, right. For those who have for those who have decided to continue their existence in the material world for the gratification of their senses, there is no chance of becoming Krishna conscious. Not by personal endeavor, by instruction from others, or by joint conferences. They are dragged by the unbridled senses into the darkest region of ignorance, and thus they madly engage in what is called chewing the chewed. So this verse is spoken by Prahlad Maharaj when his father, his beloved father Haranyakashipu, was asking him, where did you get this Krishna consciousness from? So Prahlad Maharaj wanted his father to know that there's no way his father is going to get Krishna consciousness. So he says, Matirna Krishna, one whose inclination is not to Krishna, then you're not going to get Krishna consciousness. You won't get it by your own endeavor, you won't get it by instructions from others, or by combination of anything. Prahlad Maharaj is speaking to his father, he's telling him, because you are, you have made this vow, right? Adanta go bir vishatam tamisram punas puna charvita char adanta go bir adanta go the uncontrolled senses. <coughs> Grehavrat. His father had made the vow to stay in the <coughs> Greha, in the Andakupam, in that blind well. His father was a convinced materialist and there was no way he was going to change. He had made that vow to be the Griha Medi. So Prahlad Maharaj is saying, you never become Krishna conscious. You know, he's asking me, Haranyakashipu is asking Prahlad, where did you get this Krishna consciousness from? Prahlad said, don't worry Father, you'll never get it. <laughs> Nobody will ever give it to you. <laughs> because you're convinced materialist, you're dedicated to sense gratification and you will remain chewing what has already been chewed. Right. There's no more pleasure in this material world. Uh, sometimes I don't, when I was, a, when I was a kid at school, you know, we would chew gum, you know, <laughs> and you chew the gum after you, you stick it under the table. <laughs> And, and then, you know, the next guy comes along and he may, <laughs> or maybe the next day you sit at the same table, you remember, I got that gum from yesterday, you take it and you <laughs> <laughs> There's no taste anymore, you know. There's no more juice in it. You already took out all the juice, it's all gone. So material life is like that. This desire for sense gratification, it's like chewing what has already been chewed. 
there is no hope of any pleasure, finding any enjoyment there. But there's the illusion that, well, maybe I could be lucky, you know, maybe I can find something. <laughs> the, there's a dream of the materialist that one day, although we've tried so many times, you know, I tried so many, I wasn't lucky before, this time I'll be happy. Last time it didn't work, but the next time I'm sure I can do it. <laughs> the, like this, the material, materialistic people, they make one plan after another, and they fail, and they fail again, and again, and, but still the thing, I'll just try one more time, just let me try one more time. And there's always that, it's like you're chasing the carrot, you know, they have the carrot in front of the donkey, the donkey's going forward to get the carrot, but as the donkey goes forward, the carrot also goes forward. <laughs> so the donkey never gets a carrot. In the same way, they tell people, just work a little harder, very soon you're going to get the real happiness, just keep working. Just work a little harder, just go a little, give a little more, work a little harder, and, and they're going and going. <laughs> just now coming, just now coming. The illusion, the materialistic dream, that will never fructify. You will never get that happiness which you're looking for. Because there is no real happiness in this world. The real happiness is with Krishna. From the soul, we have to come to the spiritual platform to experience real happiness. The body is not meant for happiness. The body is meant for misery. It's meant for suffering. You can get one little infection in your foot. It can be agony. Your life you be so miserable. You get a little infection, a little cut, it can give you so much problem. To try to enjoy, could you enjoy that foot? How would that, how can that foot enjoy? <laughs> to get pleasure from the body is so difficult. To get pain is very easy. You can get all kinds of pain from the body. Toothache, headache, arm ache, back ache, leg ache, knee ache. The whole body is meant to give you pain. You're trying to find happiness there? Good luck, Prabhu. <laughs> you, the, the body is not meant for happiness. But there's an illusion of pleasure. The, this body is just meant to give us trouble. And that's why we want to give it up, to get out of this world and go back to Krishna. Mm. Okay, Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai!